Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. Welcome back to another episode of Wild Wisconsin Off the Record. I'm your host, DNR's Digital Media Coordinator, Katie Grant. On September 25th, the DNR reaffirmed its commitment to addressing the impacts of climate change on Wisconsin's natural resources. In a memo to staff, Secretary-Designee Preston Cole outlined the department's role in addressing climate change and clean energy through adaptation and mitigation. From shifting weather patterns, increases in average air and water temperatures, and higher frequency and intensity of rain and snowfall events, the impacts of climate change directly impact Wisconsin. As a state that is well known for its world-class cold water fishing experiences, we could see significant changes to trout distribution throughout the state. We sat down with cold water fisheries research scientist, Matt Mitro, to learn more about the research he is working on to help determine the possible impacts of climate change on the trout population here in Wisconsin. So sit back and listen in. Um, My name is Matthew Mitro, or Matt. I work in the DNR in the Office of Applied Science. I'm a fisheries research scientist, and my focus is on cold water fishes and inland streams in Wisconsin, which pretty much means brook trout and brown trout. All right, you you beat me to my first question. What are cold water fish? So brook trout and brown trout? Yep. Um, So these are fish that require cold temperatures during the summertime when air temperatures are hottest in the state cool. require that cold water to live. Awesome. So some of the research you've done lately is kind of mm-hmm. related to trout and how climate change may or may not affect them. We'll get to that a little bit in a second. Mm-hmm. Can you start off just kind of by giving us from your perspective with how it, how it applies to fish? what is climate change and kind of what what is going on there with climate change? Okay, so what is climate change, how it applies to fish? Yeah. Um, So fish are commonly referred to as cold-blooded organisms, Mm -hmm. not the scientific term, but um, (laughs) so their body temperature reflects the temperature of their surrounding environments, the water that they live in. Mm -hmm. Um, So different species of fish have different thermal tolerances. So the warm temperatures we experience during the summer. Um, Some fish can tolerate very warm temperatures, the water you might want to go swimming in. Mm -hmm. Other fish require colder temperatures, the water that you might dip your toes in and And run away because it's too cold. cold. I've done that to my kids before. (laughs) The temperature of the water in around streams and lakes around the state reflects the average air temperature that we experience. Okay. Either the temperature of the air affecting the water directly by contact or affecting the temperature of the groundwater that then feeds the streams. Okay. Makes them cold. So if the air temperature, average air temperature increases over time, that may increase the average temperature of warm water lakes, warm water streams, cold water streams, cold springs. So if yeah. those um, thermal regimes change in the different water bodies around the state, um, some species of fish that live there now may not be able to tolerate it okay. following that change. Okay. In addition to the air temperatures, could the amount of time that we have ice on lakes and and streams and rivers, could that also impact it? Um, It certainly can. Some of the different lake species, um, warm water species, their spring spawning times may um, be dependent on ice out around around lakes or when rivers start to warm up. Okay. Um, So that could change the, what we call the phenology, the timing of different life history events. Right. Um, For trout, it's a little bit different. Okay. In that, ideally in the in an ideal trout stream in the winter, you don't have ice cover. Okay. So these are fed by cold water springs, which are cold to us when we feel them in the summertime. Right. But in the winter, they're actually relatively warm compared to other water bodies. All right. Makes sense. So those generally just stay open year-round. Ice isn't really as much of an issue. Got right. it. Let's say that these temperatures increase, 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 increase. We start to see that increase in the water temperature. What does that mean for the fish? Ultimately, if the temperatures get high enough, it will surpass some thermal tolerance limit, so the absolute highest temperature that the fish can tolerate for a given amount of time. Mm -hmm. When you get beyond that, the fish simply physiologically just can't live there. Okay. Um, But before you get to that, it'll have more subtle effects on fish. Okay. Um, It can affect the... Well, fish have different 
optimal temperature ranges for feeding, um, for growth, and the amount of time that those fish spend in those optimal temperatures can change. As, as those physiological changes happen and, and the temperatures increase, mm-hmm. you said, you know, physiologically they can't, they just can't live there anymore. Are they going to, for example, migrate and find different water to live in? Are they just going to mm-hmm. die? What What is the danger there? Well, as streams start to warm, it's unlikely that the entire stream would all of a sudden warm such okay. that the fish can tolerate it. Um, for you know, our best cold water streams that are fed by cold groundwater rather than cold surface water, the um, cold water comes into the stream, flows downstream. As it flows down and is exposed to air, it starts to warm up, and you get further enough downstream, the temperatures get too warm, and the fish don't live there. Makes so, sense. For example, in the driftless area, you may have um, streams that start from springs, full, flow through the Cooley region, and then as they get further downstream to the Kickapoo River, to the Wisconsin River, to the Mississippi River, then they hit these bigger water bodies that are warmer. So from the spring where it comes into the stream, mm-hmm. flows downstream, temperatures are ideal for trout, as they start to warm, that length of stream will shrink. So it'll okay. start to shrink back up to the headwaters where the cold water is coming in. Okay. So those fish further downstream that have ideal temperatures now, if it starts to warm by the time it gets to those fish because of climate change, then those fish are going to have to move further upstream. Okay. But there's a limit to how far up they can go. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get further upstream, the stream channel itself might be smaller. Um, maybe it's ideal habitat for young year fish, but not for adult fish, for example. Okay. Okay. So within, you know, a certain length of a stream, there's only so many mm-hmm. fish or maybe even a certain amount of a certain age of fish or size of fish that that stream can actually healthily hold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something we would refer to as the carrying capacity. Okay. And that's something that can actually change too because of changes in physical features of the stream, not simply just the change in temperature. Okay. So when you say physical features, what what do you mean there? So for an adult fish, an adult trout in a stream, you might want to have um, overhead cover, uh, deeper pools. If a, and this is another could be another consequence of climate change. If you have um, catastrophic flooding events that rip through a stream. Um, and cause severe stream bank erosion. You may have a widening of the stream and it becomes shallower and you lose that depth that provides cover for fish. Okay. Whereas the ideal stream might be narrower and deeper. So in terms of the population, you know, obviously they're going to be moving. There's only so much that they can handle. Are we in danger potentially of these these streams just simply not being able to hold these fish anymore and, and the trout just being gone from Wisconsin. I would say that danger certainly exists. It just depends on the extent of climate change that occurs. Okay. And then the question is, how soon will that occur? Right. And you know, we obviously don't have an answer for that. So whether or not these fish will live there or not depends on the rate of change, climate change now. Mm-hmm. If it, if um, climate changes very gradually mm-hmm. over the coming decades or centuries, then it would be a very gradual loss of trout. Right. If it's some catastrophic change, then it could be, happen much quicker. What is kind of the current status of this? Where are we headed? What what are the models kind of predicting f- in terms of where we're, where we're going? Okay. Um, much of our climate change work on kind of projecting what changes in fish distribution can occur. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a large collaborative event, uh, project. I was only a small part of it. But we used climate projections from the UW Climate Research Group okay. that downscaled their, the global models that many people are familiar with, to a more regional scale for the state of Wisconsin. And then we use those projected changes in temperature from a number of different uh, global climate models to feed into a model that looked at fish distribution around the state. Um, So we use this model to kind of give a prediction of what we have now. So looking for all the segments of stream throughout the state, whether how likely fish or trout are likely to be present or absent from those streams and then changed input to the model using the projected changes in climate to then make projections as to what could change based on changes in climate. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do do want to point out that distinction between prediction and projection. Okay. So prediction is what we think will happen. 
or what is there. So we were doing predictions about what is there now. Mm -hmm. The projections are for the future. We're not predicting that that will happen, but if temperatures change as the model global climate models that are downscale to Wisconsin, then that's the changes in fish that we would project to happen. Okay. So the projection is kind of like the the possibility exists potentially. To right. really muddy that <laughs> that explanation a lot, right? Um, right. So the climate models are, you know, based on data and this is their best projections about what will change. Uh, based on the input that they have in those climate models. And then we take that to the level of fish. And so if these changes occur, then we'll see these changes in fish. What does the outlook look like for those fish here in Wisconsin? Okay, so our fish distribution models made predictions as to how many stream kilometers are suitable for trout today. Okay. Um, so for brook trout, our predictions were about 34,251 kilometers of st streams suitable for brook trout and slightly less, 20,011 kilometers for brown trout. And that's the number today? That's the estimate. number of stream kilometers today. Okay. Yep. So the projections um, based on an average of a number of different global climate models that were downscaled for Wisconsin projects a loss of 68% for brook trout. So that 34,000 or so kilometers would decrease to about 10,995 kilometers. Okay. And then for brown trout, a slightly less loss of about 32%. So that 20,000 or so kilometers that we have today, decreasing to about 13,668. Wow. Might, might anglers see any effects of this right now today? No, as far as what anglers may see as climate changes and changes the conditions in streams, um, what they may notice first might be a change in the fish communities in terms of what they catch. Okay. Although they may not always see that because many of the fishes that occur in streams are not ones that anglers typically catch. As the temperatures in those streams warm during the summertime, you might start to see other fish species that we would term cool water fish species or warm water fish species showing up in those streams. Okay. Um, those cool water fish species, uh, cool water being kind of a transition between cold and warm, um, you might start to see um, white sucker would be one that anglers may catch. Um, in some streams, you might catch burbot. These are what we call transitional species. Um, they can do okay in cold water, but they can do okay in warmer water too. Okay. And maybe even um, minnow species, you may not catch them because they're very small. Mm -hmm. Some people do fish for those, micro fishing, but it's not very popular yet. Um, but you may notice these fish as you're waiting in the stream, for example. Okay. Whereas you wouldn't see them now. I guess one thing I didn't touch on on the fish distribution models were, or was how the distribution of fish would trout would change across the state. So we have a lot of trout in streams through the Driftless area, western part of the state. Okay. Up across the northern forest area of the state, up in Lake Superior Basin. Um, it all depends on you know, whether or not you have a cold water stream or not. And right. you can have cold water streams next to warm water streams. It depends on what's feeding in. So you do get cold water streams in many parts of the state. But more broadly speaking, it does seem like the driftless area is probably one of the more resilient areas of the state. Okay. And that's probably based on the karst geology and the limestone and, you know, how these springs just feed a lot of cold water into streams. Mm -hmm. um, another area where we have that uh, somewhat different geology is up in Lake Superior Basin. So up in the Bayfield Peninsula okay. is another area where streams are very cold because of the geology. Um, other parts of the state, such as the northern forested area, when you get into northern, northeastern Wisconsin, it's a little bit different. You have a little more surface flow versus groundwater flow into some of those streams. Okay. So they're, right now, many of them are cold enough for trout and they support trout, but they're different than what you see in the Driftless area or in Lake Superior. And we know this based on measuring stream, stream temperature year-round, so not just during the summer. So summer is important because upper thermal tolerance limits are important to trout, but winter is very important as well. So in the Lake Superior area, the Driftless area, where you have a lot of cold groundwater feeding these streams, many of those streams don't freeze over in the winter. So everything around you could be covered with snow and lakes frozen, but the streams are open. Right. Uh, their temperatures might be in the 40 degrees Fahrenheit, not 32 or close to freezing. 
But when you get to northern parts of the state, Russell Northern Forested Areas, northern Wisconsin, northeastern Wisconsin, where you don't have that cold groundwater, it's more surface driven, those streams get very cold in the winter. So okay. they're getting down close to freezing for long periods of time, which could in also indicate that those areas are not suitable for overwintering and those fish really need to move back and forth between summer and winter habitat. Oh, okay. So I guess it's a way of saying some of those areas are where we're expecting more of the losses to occur with trout okay. should climate change as, as is being projected. Okay. So where you have that cold groundwater, those are the areas that are going to be more resilient to changes in air temperature, okay. affecting stream temperature. We've done some stuff on social media talking about gill lice, for example. Mm -hmm. How would something like that relate to this? Is, is that impacted mm -hmm. by climate change potentially? It is, and that's one of the things I have looked at in some of the work I've done. And it's actually a good example of what can change in relation to climate conditions um, before conditions become lethal to fish. Okay. To trout, such that a trout couldn't live there. Um, so this all came about in um, some work we were doing on Ash Creek in Richland County. We were doing work on a brook trout population there. For the first number of years we had worked there, gill were not observed. Uh, then they did show up and then very quickly became an epizootic, which is kind of like an epidemic. Every fish essentially got infected at that point. Okay. And this is a stream that also had some brown trout in it. And because of some complications in management there, um, I'd say complications, maybe that's not the right word, but um, brown trout had been removed in the past from that stream to protect the brook trout. So okay. those two species do compete. Okay. Um, so brown trout were suppressed, keeping they were transferred out downstream, and brook trout were allowed to prol proliferate in that stream. Um, gill lice showed up, started infecting brook trout. They don't infect brown trout. It's thought that the gill lice co-evolve with brook trout, and the parasite is very specific to brook trout. So brown trout are not affected by it. Over time in that stream, um, the brown trout suppression had stopped, so brown trout, brown trout started coming back. Okay. We had been collecting what we call stock recruitment data, so keeping track of the size of the adult population, how many eggs they produce, so the production of the population, and then the recruitment, how many young a year are being observed the following year. Mm -hmm. And tracking that over time, we were able to see changes in recruitment, changes in the number of young a year brook trout that survive uh, from being spawned the previous fall, and seeing those changes in relation to different changes in the environmental conditions or habitat of the stream. So when you had ideal conditions, no brown trout present, um, no flood events, ideal temperatures, brook trout did very well. They had very high recruitment, produced okay. a lot of young year. When you have um, flooding events that occur at, um, typically late spring, early summer, sometimes even later summer if the floods are big enough, uh, those flood events can have an effect on the young year that survives. So a lot of those young year may not survive, make it wash downstream, leave the system. So when we did have a couple flood events, we saw that reduced reduction in recruitment. So something that happens, not necessarily bad, but mm -hmm. it, it can happen. And then when the brown trout came back and we didn't have flooding events, we then again saw this effect on brook trout recruitment. So you had that competition between brook trout and brown trout. Okay. Um, with more adult brown trout being present in the stream that kind of limited the brook trout in terms of what they can do in producing young year. And then when the gill lice showed up, they were only infecting brook trout. They started infecting young year, which is kind of unusual in that young year fish are a much smaller target for the parasite. Uh, the brown trout had been suppressed again, so they weren't an issue. There was no flooding events, but we then again saw the impact on recruitment. So brook trout took a bigger hit on recruitment than we'd ever seen in the stream. But the few brown trout that were there, there were still some, although not a lot, they actually had very good recruitment year. Okay. So conditions were ideal for fish to reproduce and young year to be produced, but the brook trout were being infected by the parasite and they were not surviving. So we were able to pin it on the parasite affecting the brook trout. Right. And then as to why that may have happened at that time, the um, environmental conditions in the stream in terms of temperature and water level were ideal what we would think would be ideal for the parasite life cycle. Okay. So you had a unusually warm winter. I can't remember the exact year, but it was a very warm spring. I remember during March, the year that this happened, 
we had 80-degree temperatures. We were biking to work in shorts and right. kind of enjoying summer temperatures. And um, the stream temperatures were typical of what we see in June, but we were seeing them in March now. And that was ideal for the parasite's reproductive cycle. So instead of this, para the parasite has a roughly 30- to 40-day reproductive cycle. Okay. So in a typical year, in a cold water stream, they may be active from maybe May through September and have a certain number of life cycles. In this particular year, you had a very warm winter, so there wasn't probably wasn't much mortality of fish or parasite over winter. And then you had a jump start in the reproductive cycle a couple months early. So you had many more cycles in that year than you typically have in other years. Okay. So you're getting many more opportunities for fish to be infected. Right. You know, in a typical stream where we may see gill lice, you may get one or a very small percentage of fish may have a dozen or so parasites on them. Many only have a couple or mm -hmm. none. Um, here we're getting fish with up to 100 or more parasites. Right. Obviously, in theory, yeah. as those temperatures, air temperatures rise, water temperatures mm -hmm. rise, it's, in theory, creating an ideal condition for that to happen. Right. And then again, what's a consequence of this, when you have a stream with brook trout and brown trout, brown trout often outcompete brook trout. Um, many aspects of their life history kind of favor them. They live longer, get bigger, produce more eggs. So over time, they can kind of build up their numbers more than brook trout. And then the competitive interactions can limit brook trout as well. Mm -hmm. When you add in um, this parasite, that brook trout can tolerate it low levels. I mean, the parasites, we think, native to Wisconsin, much like brook trout are. Mm -hmm. We have documentation of the parasite going back over a century. Having that parasite infecting brook trout and brown trout being present, seeing that reduction in brook trout recruitment just kind of opens the door for brown trout to really take off. Right. And what we've seen in a couple streams when that happens, the brook trout numbers that were once really high, people catch a lot of brook trout, start to go down, and the brown trout take over. So you're seeing kind of a shift in that community composition. What can we do to tackle this problem? I'll first add in terms of the gill ice parasite, um, it's not something that affects people at all. So it may look unappetizing if you catch a brook trout and it's mm -hmm. infected, but you can still eat that fish. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Um, so, in terms of the parasite, if it's you see a highly infected fish and you do like to eat fish, removing that highly infected fish could potentially benefit the stream. Um, that's something that can certainly help. In terms of climate change, that's a little bit trickier. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I would say there is a lot that we can do to help kind of build resilience, what we would call resiliency into the stream or resistance. The idea that you're kind of making the or helping maintain habitat conditions that are favorable to trout in the face of changing climate conditions. And these are many things that we've done over the past few decades um, since, I guess, going back even further to the mid uh, 20th century. Some of the pioneering work that was done in Wisconsin by uh, Bob Hunt, um, Ray White, for example, in terms of stream habitat restoration. So. We had degraded stream conditions in the past because of poor land use practices. We've identified the causes of those um, effects, uh, the causes of the degraded conditions in streams and did a lot of work to fix them. So if you fish for trout in streams in Wisconsin, in addition to your fishing license, you're required to buy a trout stamp. Mm -hmm. And that money is solely dedicated to stream restoration work. So if you have a degraded stream where you have st stream bank erosion, um, the water becomes shallow and wide, you don't have that cover for fish, the stream habitat restoration work can help to kind of narrow and deepen the stream channel. And what that will do is help keep that cold water coming from groundwater cold as it flows downstream, as opposed to flowing down through wide and shallow areas. And another um, important aspect of the stream restoration work is, again, dealing with the stream bank erosion. So when you do have these catastrophic floods that we tend to be seeing pretty frequently these days, by Addressing the stream bank erosion where, say, you go to some streams now and you would see a, an eroded stream bank, so it's just a kind of a vertical wall of dirt. Mm -hmm. And kind of sloping those back, so you're, instead of having that vertical wall of exposed dirt that becomes eroded when the streams go up and um, hit those areas, uh, sloping those stream banks back and opening them up to the floodplain. So when you do get these flooding events, that energy from the flood is just quickly dissipated out to the floodplain. 
Oh, okay. And we've seen plenty of examples in the Driftless area where this work had been done and you had these flash flood events without any significant damage to those areas. So Interesting. not to say it can work everywhere. It may depend right. on the gradient and the flood conditions and so uh, forth. Yeah, but how bad the flood actually is. But, but it certainly has worked in many areas. Okay. All right. What kind of timeline are we looking at for a potential really severe impact on the trout population? If you base what you think is going to happen in the next five years based on what you saw in the previous five years, you know, I wouldn't expect very much happening right away. Mm -hmm. That said, many of the changes that could be happening could be subtle. And I can kind of give one example of that in terms of uh, long-term stream temperature data. So I've been working with a stream temperature data set for the Kinnikinnick River. Um, this was collected by a member of Trout Unlimited since 1992. Okay. Uh, so this goes back many decades. And one of the ways that we can look at stream temperature in relation to trout thermal tolerance limits is by looking at the average temperature over a given period of time during the summer and what the maximum is for that time period. So for, say, the summer, June, July, and August time period, if you take an average daily temperature, so every day you average the temperature that's, in this case, measured every hour in a stream, okay. and then find the maximum daily average. Okay and then track that over time. You know, we've done this work relating the presence and absence of trout to those averages, and that's how we determine what's cold water versus cool water versus warm water. And then you wanna look at those trends over time. Are we seeing changes in that? Now the maximum daily average is probably not a good metric or way to look at it because of the complication of flooding. So if you have, um, you're dealing with a cold water stream, you get a rain, rain event during the summer, that rain is water is going to be warmer in the stream. Right. And you get this sudden influx of water into the stream, that's going to spike the stream temperature up, but just for a very short period of time. Okay. So, so that shouldn't, could be in less. theory, from a water temperature standpoint, that wouldn't necessarily have an effect. Right. Because it would probably be too brief a time period. Okay. Um, but then if you look at um, larger periods, longer periods of time, so say over a seven-day period, 14-day period, maybe four-week period, six-week period, then you start to kind of get away from those um, rain, you know, rain events that may make a short-term change mm -hmm. and deal more with the average temperature experience over the summer. And when you start to look at those at longer time periods, that's when we're starting to see a change. Okay. And what we think is happening, and this actually ties in with what the climate scientists are saying is going to happen, um, they're projecting that the changes we'll see in the summer will be our nighttime low temperatures not getting as low as they've been. Okay. As opposed to daily high temperatures getting higher. And I would say over the past couple of decades, probably have not seen that change in the daily high temperature. You know, we've had some pretty cold summers recently. Yeah. A lot of average summers, but not, you know, 110 degree Fahrenheit right. days or anything right. like that. Um, but what's probably less noticeable, or maybe just noticeable to some people, is that nighttime cool temperatures aren't quite as cool. Right. And we're starting to, and that would be reflected in these longer term averages. So we measure temperature hourly in a stream because there is that diel cycle. And the daytime temperatures get higher in a stream at nighttime when the air temperatures are cooler, you don't have the sun, mm -hmm. temperatures go down a bit. And so it seems like those nighttime temperatures are not getting quite as low as they have. So it's still getting low enough that these temperatures that we're observing in Kinnikinnick River, for example, are still within, well within thermal tolerance limits for trout. Okay. But if you look at that trend over the past 30, roughly 30 year time period, you do start to see that slight increase in what we're seeing for those measurements over these broader periods of time during the summer. Okay. So that's kind of capturing that nighttime temperatures not getting as cool as they had in the past. Are fish, so there, there's the saying, you know, if you put a, f a frog in boiling water, he'll notice it. But if you put him mm -hmm. in when it's cold and you boil it and it gets warmer slowly, mm. you know, he, he won't notice. Are fish, is, is that kind of a similar thing with fish? Um, that's a really good question. And I would say no. Okay. And I'm basing that on, on some work that we've done actually in the Namakagan River. And this was kind of inspired by concerns about climate change and warming mm -hmm. of the river. Um, so the Namakagan River does have brown trout in it. Okay. And some of the upper reaches may have brook trout as well. But the river does get kind of borderline warm for trout during the summer. Okay. And so we were kind of taking advantage of this new technology, uh, which is what we call a thermal tag. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it's a tag that we can insert into a fish. You have to do it surgically because it's a little bit big, maybe a centimeter and a half long, half okay. a centimeter in diameter. Okay. Um, but this tag measures the temperature wherever the fish goes and records it hourly. Pretty cool stuff. Yep. So, and again, with fish being the same temperature as the surrounding water, this is a way to measure the temperature wherever the fish goes. And oftentimes when we measure temperature in streams, we'll put a stationary data logger out there. So we'll pick a spot in the stream, put the data logger there, leave it there for the summer, for the year, whatever, come Mm -hmm. back, retrieve it, and you get that record of temperature at that particular spot. Okay. The fish may not be there, though. They may move around. Right. They often do. So this was kind of a neat way to get around that. So we went out and put 11 tags out. Okay. So they're kind of expensive, so we couldn't tag hundreds of fish. Right. Um, but we had 11 of these, and we put them in 11 brown trout and released them into the Namakagan River. In, this is early in the summer, in May or June. This year? Uh, this was in 2016. Okay. I was hoping for a scorcher of a summer that would kind of make these fish do interesting things. It didn't turn out that way. It was actually kind of a cool summer. Okay. Um, but we went back at the end of summer in uh, early September, and unfortunately, to retrieve these tags, you have to catch the fish. So this was kind of <laughs> a gamble. We didn't know, you know, if the fish didn't survive, if it got real warm and they moved and we just couldn't find them, whatever. Right. We were able to recover uh, seven of these fish. Okay. Um, two of the fish had lost their tags. You do get tag loss on occasion. But I think we had five that were recovered. So we recovered these temperature data loggers and recorded the temperature. And the temperatures they experienced were pretty closely matched to the stationary data loggers, and they were within thermal tolerance limits for trout. Okay. But what was interesting is we found during a couple days during the summer when we had the highest temperatures that were observed in terms of air temperature and water temperature, Mm -hmm. these fish were finding some sort of microhabitat that was just slightly cooler than the ambient temperature measured by the stationary data loggers. Oh, okay. So maybe, you know, a few tenths of a degree cooler. So would that be like where... A tree is kind of overhanging, and so there's shade, so the water might be a little bit cooler right there. That corn type of a thing? Could be. I think it would be more likely to groundwater seeping into okay. the stream. Okay. That makes sense. And we don't know where that is. Right. It could be very small, but that would point out that it would seem to suggest that these fish were aware of the change in the temperature, and then they were able to find some source of temperature that was slightly cooler. All right. That That's cool that, you know... We have the technology to be able to, to do those sort of things now. Mm-hmm. And I should add, we did test these in a hatchery environment first and looked at the margin of error on the temperatures that are recorded by the day logger okay. versus the temperature stream. And the changes that were observed in terms of what the fish experienced were outside that margin of error. So we were okay. confident that these fish were finding this microhabitat right. that was slightly cooler than what you typically see in the stream. Is there a potential that climate change, you know, the increase of the water, them having fewer kilometers of stream to be able to live in, could that affect the overall size of trout that we're seeing, like the maximum size of what we're mm-hmm. seeing? Might they stay smaller, bigger? Yep, yeah, um, another good question. And what may happen, it'll vary depending on whether it's a brook trout or brown trout, they both have similar thermal tolerance levels for the ultimate high temperature they can tolerate. Okay. But within the range of temperatures that they can tolerate, brook trout tend to have a preference for somewhat cooler water than brown trout. Okay. So over the course of the summer, there's a certain amount of time that they spend in this optimal range for feeding and for growth. Depending on how cold the stream is, we have some streams that are just very cold, others Mm -hmm. cold enough for trout, others kind of at the upper end. If you have kind of a change where some of these fish are spending more time in that optimal temperature range because of warming, maybe a really cold stream is getting a little bit warmer, you could see improvements in feeding and growth. I guess what I'm saying, it it kind of depends on what the temperatures in the stream are now and how they're changing. Okay. So some streams, you could see improvements in growth as they tend to warm, but then as you get past a certain point, you get back into temperatures that are out greater than their preferred temperatures and then you would see decreases in growth. You can support stream restoration projects and more by finding your local watershed councils or stream habitat restoration groups. Have a question for Matt or any of our experts? Email us, dnrpodcast at wisconsin.gov. And be sure to subscribe so you never miss a future episode. Thanks for listening.